Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining this uh, webinar, which is uh, the third part of our conference about audience development for classical music. This conference has been uh, on for two years. This is the second edition. And we had our two panels on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, first, I want to say what sort of a conference it is and what are we actually dealing with here. We are talking about audience development uh, for all of those who didn't participate on Wednesday, Thursday or last year. I will say what audience development really means. Uh, the, one of the definitions, there are many definitions, says that it is a set of activities that are directed towards meeting the needs of existing audience and at the same time help developing the relationship with the new audiences as well. And uh, we are trying at conferences like this uh, together under the same um, umbrella, the researchers, musicians, uh, producers, managers of the classical uh, ev music events to make them discuss and exchange their experiences and benefit from each other. Since now we have the feeling that people were working on a separate um, niche and they didn't really listen to each other. They didn't communicate about this lack of audience. Um, who are we exactly? That is the first uh, thing to be said. Um, I am the um, cultural manager from the uh, agency Orfeus, which is registered in Sweden. My name is Milica Lundin. And um, um, this is my partner, uh, Vladimir. Hello, everyone. My name is Vladimir Djordjevic, and I'm the chairman of a multiple developer association based in Belgrade, Serbia, and also artists manager. Right. Um, and we have pers uh, our participants uh, from the two panels. We had to reduce the number to five, and we selected um, our colleagues from abroad. Uh, there were 10 of us at, at the conference, but we are introducing now uh, those who uh, were online from other countries, from Sweden, Croatia, and uh, Slovenia. I don't know if we have Slovenia online uh, right now, or maybe they're joining a little bit later. Uh, go ahead and present yourself, please. Ulrika. Yes, I'm uh, Ulrika Skog Holmgard, and I am a uh, uh, producer and project manager within the performing arts. I've emphasized on theater for like 25 years, but uh, I've also worked really broad with different kinds of um, um, arts. And um, I was talking about the fusion, the, the way different genres can actually meet and what kind of strain that could put on the, on the, the entire production, but also what great that can come out of it. And then we have uh, David Tirin from Stockholm. Uh, hello, I'm uh, David Tirin from Royal College of Music in Stockholm. I am a senior lecturer in musicology and I teach primarily music history. And what was your contribution about David? Um, yes, my contribution was a, a co um, cooperation with Eva Boyne Horvich, a professor in music and health. And it was about uh, audiences, and I had a historical perspective on audiences and how they relate to music. And uh, Eva, who was the co-author uh, of this research, could you tell us about the chart and what you do? Yes, good evening, everyone. My name is Eva Boiner Horvitz, working here at, uh, you can see, on the back side of the picture here, Royal College of Music in Stockholm, together with Dari, David Thurian. And I'm also affiliated with uh, Clinical Neuroscience at Karolinska Institute here in Stockholm, Sweden. So my contribution to uh, the conference so far has been uh, on research and performance evaluations. What is going on in between musicians and in the interplay between musicians and their audience. So we have been doing uh, measures on, on the heart rate variability and flow measurements. And we have also uh, research on emotional regulation. Is it so that we are more 
benevolent after a concert and more pro-social in our behavior. So those kinds of things are we looking at. Thank you. And we also have Katarina Majora and Juražić from Rijeka. Hello. Hello, nice to be here and thank you for your invitation. It's really an honor to be here with you. Um, I work as an audience development programs manager in Croatian National Theatre in Rijeka. Mm, and uh, I had chance during um, this conference to present programs, audience development programs that we develop and that we address both two usual suspects and new audiences. Um, I showed some uh, examples of uh, what we do, what activities we do, who do we address, and uh, how we try to create that respected relationship between audiences and artists. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, today we have to present what we concluded. Uh, we cannot present uh, all these uh, presentations in detail because there was a lot that was said. But uh, what was different between this year's conference and the last year's conference is that uh, we had, first of all, regional experience that we didn't have before. We listened mostly about Serbia and Serbian showcases. And this year we had not just from Croatia and Slovenia, but we had a lot from abroad. And we discussed even those uh, practices that were not represented by a person in, in Germany and in France. Um, we also had a participation of Faculty of Music of Belgrade, which was uh, missing last year very much, and because it's one of the main actors in uh, this conference and the topic that we're covering. And uh, um, the conclusions were that we talked a lot about opera this time. Uh, that was just mentioned last year. Uh, I indicated myself that I uh, am following some uh, good practices and good examples of how opera uh, in many countries uh, turned around their appearance. They used to be a, a art form almost in crisis. And now uh, with a, uh, different strategies and techniques and uh, so to say modern little um, assets and tricks had uh, completely um, revived itself and this is something that classical concert could learn from we have a very good experiences there and we uh, heard three different experiences of, of, of that sort then we talked about institutionals that are specialized in classical music and how they can contribute uh, to the overall um, attitudes towards the audience development uh, within young population, young musicians. Last year we spoke mostly about cultural policy, and cultural cultural institutions, more than much more than this time. Then we had less statistics this year, less uh, we li didn't listen so much to the numbers as much as we heard observations and opinions. Uh, so to say we were uh, uh, focused on the qualitative and not so much on quantitative, uh, quantitative research. Uh, of, also, we got an um, impressive report on empirical research that Eva was just talking about, about human mind and music. That is something that all of us who are playing know something about. It started many years ago with uh, so-called pseudo theory of Mozart effect. But now, finally, we have some uh, some real facts and some real researches that we can build the theory of how music influences the mind and uh, and, uh, uh, and and we can think about like how we can use the results from, the, from this research and sure, put yes. it into the the, the effect to, to build the audience. Uh, other conclusions were uh, about technical and digital techniques that we are applying now uh, for promotion and also for broadcast. This question was really all the time present in our, uh, in our discussions because of the times that we are in uh, connected to this uh, COVID uh, situation that we have. And uh, somebody, uh, uh, recommended to us before uh, that we should include that subject in, in uh, conference, conference, but it yeah. was absolutely not needed, as you all saw. It, it was always, always there, and it, we came back and back to that. And um, 
some very nice recommendations were uh, pop out of it. Uh, and we had for the first time the first hand showcase about stage art uh, for fusion uh, that Ulrika was uh, presenting, which was extremely impressive. That is something that we, in theory, all the time mentioned, but we never saw uh, something so uh, from a close point of view. Um, now, uh, maybe Vladimir would like to uh, ask our our guests. Uh, yes, definitely. So what uh, Milica was talking about were kind of um, what, what we saw as uh, the, our, our um, uh, the, the, the top the highlights of, of, of the conference and the, the things that uh, put the, the, left the biggest impression on us. But what I would like to hear from you as a presenters is um, did uh, you hear something new? And also, um, I would like to kind of uh, uh, see how we can look back at, at, at the conference from the point of a practitioner, like Katerina, who working at the institution that uh, organizes events, and researchers on the other side. Who wants to go first? Katerina, maybe, because she was named. <laughs> yeah, okay. I would actually, I, I would like to hear from Katarina uh, when you look at the at the results of, of the scientific research that were presented uh, um, by Dr. Eva and uh, uh, David uh, how, how you can see the use of this data and uh, how you can utilize this as an institution to, to build the audience yes um, every activity should have uh, research and data collecting as its starting point because uh, there is no point in doing something based on your pre prejudice or somebody else's prejudice you know and we are all full of them wanting that <laughs> or not um, so it's really valuable to know what you're dealing with and afterwards at the end do the assessment and do the evaluation so that you can see where did you get. Um, I find this conference really very interesting. I really heard uh, many, many new and interesting um, stuff based on the various approaches. So that's something that we really need because we all work in our, you know, um, own um, context that that is familiar that we are familiar with. So this kind of uh, approaching is is really interesting. Uh, what would I maybe highlight, although I really uh, enjoyed uh, all presentations, is um, that one that um, um, confirms um, something that I think also, and that is that the um, uh, position of classical music and culture and uh, our national theater, in fact, as well, is shifted on margins today. Um, maybe uh, even at the you can identify it as subculture today so it's really now some not something that uh, is a result of our failure or or something like that but it's just matter of historical and political context that we have to count on you know we have to adjust to that uh, presence and uh, to to act uh, based based on that um so I'm just wondering how how relevant we are, to whom are we relevant today? What do we do to become more relevant? Uh, what do we do to, be, to become more participative? Because uh, I, I would say that uh, participative and inclusive culture and society and world is our only, you know, presence. And um, if I may quote, if I may quote one of, uh, creation uh, uh, writers, Dubrovka Urišić, she says that uh, all great cultures are inclusive, that's why they are great, and all small cultures are exclusive, that's why they remain small. Oh, that was good. Um, uh, David, would, would you tell us what was your uh, impression of... Uh, well, thank you. Very interesting um, food for thought here. And uh, 
Yeah, good questions here. Uh, to whom are we relevant and how do we make ourselves more relevant for classical music? And obviously we have to target the young generation, I believe, and uh, reach out for youth culture and make classical music relevant for youth. And uh, uh, I think we should really uh, emphasize the power of classical music in a live setting uh, so young people can experience classical music live with real instruments and their full dynamics in a nice hall, concert hall, and to experience uh, classical music. And we can use digital social media and so on, uh, digital tools in order to promote classical music to young people. You know, we can reach out and make classical music available uh, to young people by, by um, advertising on social media and so on. But we should not compromise on the powerful experience of classical music in a live setting, I believe. What I liked uh, very much uh, when we discussed uh, last time is when you said that uh, uh, composers like uh, Beethoven or Wagner were using like the most uh, advanced, like uh, innovative uh, approach to composing and uh, were some kind of avant-garde and that we have to bear this in mind when, when approaching new audiences in, in our times. Yeah, interesting. Both Beethoven and Wagner were totally... Um, they never compromised. They had strong vision, and they took all that they had in their power to fulfill that vision. And they took no consideration whatsoever mm. to anything else. And they were actually they were quite unsympathetic as human beings in in many ways. But they had a, an, an artistic uh, vision, and they never compromised. And uh, Wagner was really the most expensive. Wagner's operas in the 1870s were the most expensive music piece of music work ever and there was no way he could f finance that so he had a powerful sponsor who, who put in a, a huge amount of money for him to, to, to realize his operas you know so you have to work with promoters and sponsors and people who might uh, support classical music you know uh, like Wagner did and Beethoven mm. uh, in my view yeah, yeah thank you Eva, could you please tell us, um, we, we, we discussed your um, scientific method and uh, uh, research that you did, and uh, I was particularly touched with the end of life situations and um, time tracking and the impression of, uh, of time. And uh, will you please tell us a little bit more about uh, that? Yes, uh, first I would like to share my take home message from the conference day because I found a couple of keywords here and uh, we were talking about how to get access to uh, all of those multisensory artistic uh, activities and uh, I see that there is a need of expansion. We need to expand ourselves to be able to also collaborate in a more multi Task way, tasking way. There is also another keyword that I was thinking about after the, the Thursday uh, event. It's about interdisciplinarity, how to collaborate interdisciplinary. So I, I, I need to say that as well. And another perspective was uh, to understand each other's uh, capacities and knowledge. We need to also reach out and also share our research. After Thursday's event, I have a lot have had a lot of emails from participants and I have shared uh, research results. I think it's very uh, truly important to um, make that more uh, useful and implement the results we have. So with that said, I would like to also uh, share some data from the end of life uh, situations we have been working with hospice in Russia, in St. Petersburg. And we have been following patients and uh, a methodology where uh, people in end of life, patients in end of life situation can wish what kind of music would they like to hear and uh, how can this uh, be presented live or recorded. Uh, one uh, interesting thing after the studies were that there is a new perspective of time. We call it the Kairos time, which means the qualitative time. There is no chronological time in the Kairos perspective, which means that with music, 
even though it's well presented live or if it's recorded there is a stretch into the time axis that we can perceive old memories and also future wishes in this at the same time so this perspective if we would like to let's say we have a purpose with all the work we are doing to give an idea how it is to stretch the time perspective and be part of your whole uh, being at the same time in a concert hall for example we could use music in a more prolonged way and deepen that uh, knowledge for for all of us I, I see us all as multi-sensory artists and we need to collaborate otherwise we we can't reach our new generation you mentioned the uh, multitasking here and this is a world which is pretty much around uh, in our times and uh, people are like uh, computers trying to do many things at a time but as a scientist do you could you say that multitasking as we actually understand it is really possible for uh, people does it is it something which is dependable on the uh, personal capacity or there is uh, more to it but this is why we need to collaborate because we have different uh, specific uh, knowledge and then i will relate to the methodologies we use because if we ask ourselves is this research is that a hypothesis testing or is it something we would like to use because we would like to change our societies if it is to change our societies we need to work and collaborate with epidemiological data with quantitative methodologies and we need to have a uh, big power and do power analysis if we would like to test different hypotheses we need to start with case studies and we need also to have maybe the first person perspective involved. There is a rich uh, context of researchers, uh, for example, in France with Claire Petit-Manguin, she's working with microphenomenology. If we don't know what kind of perceptions or what kind of phenomenon that we are after, we may use a microphenomenology perspective, ask questions, how do we know if we appreciate this how do we know if we learn something from this concert how do we know etc we need to ask this in an um, and use the embodied theory so i will say the collaboration is uh, is the key to be able to change our society in the way we would like to but we need to know what kind of variables do we need to change uh, isn't multitasking, uh, in a way, this collaboration of art within, let's say, theater, TV, uh, movies, there, is, there are elements of all the artistic, uh, there's visual aesthetics, there is uh, acting, there is music, and by receiving all that, are, are we not multitasking at that time? What, what do you think? So what you are talking about, Milica, it's the uh, multimodal theory here. All right. No. So, and the multimodal theory is very useful because as a human being, we need to be aware that we have all those different perceptions. We have the auditory, the visual, the motor, the, 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 the emotional, the cognitive, etc. And we need to be aware that we are, as a different, uh, as an audience, very different when it comes to perception. We do have different ways of perceiving. Some perceiving. of us are more visual, and some of us are more uh, emotional. So this is why we also need to ask the question: How do we know what kind of audience we have there? Exactly. The more experienced and especially elderly audience is, I think, more capable of listening and analyzing the form, which is so uh, extreme in the case of classical music. Uh, uh, if you are listening on a level of melody or rhythm, then you get fed up after a very short time. But if you are used to um, uh, seeing the whole form, just like one battlefield, 
then you are engaged in listening for much longer period, right? Yes, I think you are talking about the aesthetical part, part here, which is also very important for us to discuss. So maybe I think Ulrika can, can go into the aesthetical uh, point of view here, which is immensely important. Can you, Ulrika? Well, <clears throat> I think I must say first, also give a little bit of reflection that uh, uh, it's so interesting with this uh, input and also this um, from this perspective to look at things. And I, I'm much more hands-on in my, in my entire 25, 30 years. And I'm asking myself more uh, with this, um, the audience development, why? And who's actually in charge of setting the, the question and the goal? I was just wondering, when have we reached the goal? Uh, I was thinking, I, I looked it up, and I think that our classical station, if you take it from a listening uh, point of view, has like 13% weekly listening rate. Uh, would we like it to be 15%? Are we working in order to keep the 13? I think this, I mean, I'm just scraping these questions that I think that it is quite uh, interesting actually, and, and why? Why do we need it? Do we really have to work hard for a new generation? Or does it come automatically? Is classical music, is opera, is it an acquired taste that it takes 20 years in order to get there? Will we, are we worrying for nothing? Could it be really, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of feeling two questions. Yeah, finding the youth and keeping the, the, uh, the older um, audience. And is it important that they come to their concert halls? Is that the place where we'll meet in the future in 20 years time? Is it, or is it the digital solution that we will all be digital and it's just be mus musicians meeting somewhere? Well, uh, somewhere on the way, somebody said uh, the other day that uh, the most exquisite um, experience is when you are face to face with the musicians that you can yeah understand uh, the any art form the best when you are present at the event at the live uh, performance because the energy that the performer is giving to you is not transmittable on any I, I believe so too I mentioned that when the when the Royal Opera in Stockholm when they let the go of the tickets the upcoming concerts uh, or, or performances they had like 2,000 people queuing up uh, in order to get to get tickets. I think I mentioned that. And uh, I think that there will always be this need to really be close to the experience and, and, and the music. And I think that, um, uh, I think one way, I think theater could, for example, um, come closer to classical music. We could experience much more because we were also talking about the need for perfection or not. Uh, if it was pos if it's possible to see that no, it doesn't have to be perfect, pitch perfect, which you can actually with with today's technology, you can you can have an, a perfect concert because you can go in and you can change and you can make it just sound perfect. But I don't think that is what you strive for. And if you look at this, if you go, I think that finding finding youth, we have a we already have this do-it-yourself generation, and people want to be able to uh, participate. And then you can look at it from two perspectives regarding finding the youth. It could be non-musical kids. That could be, uh, for example, through gaming. Gaming is really huge. And we know that uh, Malmö, Malmö, um, um, Malmö <laughs> Symphony Orchestra, sorry. Uh, they, they did great when they did this Assassin, Assassin Creed. I think they did this uh, and they were like big posters all over in England. Uh, and that was a, a way of actually uh, creating a bridge, bridging over to to a younger audience. But it could also be, I think, uh, with, uh, with people actually into music and um, future musicians by creating these the smaller rooms. You were talking about uh, the need to create something that attracts, that is relevant. And I think that it has to be something I can imagine when Mozart, when we're going back in the time, there was a jazzy. It could be jazzy. It could be maybe because they were drunk that they could be you know, just let let go of things. Yeah, be playful. 
and to create those small rooms. And I think that is something that would have to come from the opera houses or the concert halls to create those rooms. If you want to have the, the, the level, the, the professional level still to, to go along with it. But I mean, those are the things uh, finding the, but what I'm, I'm really thinking of is we're keeping the old audience, the audience that we already have. Uh, and that brings me into this uh, to teach how to use the, the digital tools that we were just, we were touching. And I think that it's, uh, it's the, uh, the, the least expensive and least time consuming is actually to educate uh, older people, middle age and, and, uh, and plus, uh, in order to, to have more people to get access to new digital tools and distribution. Those were my, my thoughts from two fantastic uh, evenings last week, but uh, ways to pay off. Actually, I really like yeah. what you just said about, um, uh, about, you know, like when we say audience development, we, each of us uh, maybe thinks about that from a different perspective. Are we talking about growing the audience, getting mm -hmm. more people to listen to music or live? Are we talking about um, uh, rejuvenating the audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we talk about digital tools, we, first of all, we think about digital tools as a concept to reach new generations and to rejuvenate the audience. And what you just said about the existing old audience, there will be a moment when they will not be physically able to come to the concert mm -hmm. halls mm -hmm. and still will be willing to listen to live music and uh, and this education uh, to use the digital tools comes as a great uh, great uh, solution very simple solution to, to keep music with with them also we know that there are professional audience music lovers mass audience and uh, non-audience uh, as as it was told so what is it actually that we are trying to tackle with, uh, with, with, with the audience development to get uh, more of these and less of those? What is, what is our goal? Because like the mass audience, sometimes I feel like we're talking how we can um, educate audience to have a more appreciative approach towards music, to understand music and to have their own taste in music. Not just to accept what's, what's been, served, yes. yeah, which would be like this mass audience group, which is largest and uh, uh, easiest to manipulate. So, so I always feel like we're trying to 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 to, to get this higher level uh, music lovers and professionals, or just people who who can um, uh, find the music uh, something they're looking for, not. We have we have to guess uh, their wishes. <laughs> See, yeah. so. But I see recommendation here. We need more playfulness. We need more variety, because different audience, different types of concerts, and it has to exist in a different levels. Not the con classical event, classical music event shouldn't be only about strict performances and uh, perfectionism, right? But um, when when you study the discipline of audience development, then your teacher will always mention that there are different audience developments or different problems, whether you have an audience who used to come but cannot go to the events anymore because of Whatever reason. change yeah. in the um, uh, family situation or lack of funds or, uh, you know, lost their job and don't have um, money or they move to a place where they don't have access to event. They have to go digital, or you want to address the audience who never ever consume anything of any sort of art, uh, or you want to address the audience who, yes, does consume some uh, art form, but not exactly the one that you want to promote. So these are totally different techniques, and totally different points of view, and uh, uh, different outcomes as well. Uh, does Katarina have any uh, suggestion for the recommendation of this year's conference? What do you think? What should we send into the world after this discussion? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's 
that's maybe too much for this moment for me, but um, I would like to refer on what you're saying about digital tools. Um, I'm not sure um, that uh, we are uh, uh, we are explaining digital tool in all its, you know, in all its possibilities, because digital tool is not one way street, you know, it's not something that I sit uh, passively at my home and choose what to watch and uh, what to hear. But uh, on the contrary, that's something that engages me, gives me chance to, uh, to give my feedback and um, to be, um, you know, uh, to stand stand behind uh, your words and your ideas. And uh, another thing, uh, not just feedback, but uh, for example, digital storytelling is an audience development tool that engages audiences uh, in, um, in, in a way that they uh, share their stories, their emotions, their feelings, their suggestions. Uh, and they create content, you know, so it's not just about sharing our content, but to embracing audiences content and uh, yes, to, to take that uh, as, as, you know, uh, something like plural, plural uh, truth of, of our uh, art and culture. We remember last year, Martin Larsson uh, from Sweden told us that the uh, questionnaires that were uh, uh, spread uh, in circulating, circulating yeah. after the concerts among younger uh, visitors were not at all filled by themselves, but by their, the the person who took them to the concert by a grandfather, a grandmother, mother, you know, parents. So we never really got the impressions and opinions of children. We do actually, we do not know what they really want because uh, we have a mediator uh, who is uh, acting as a filter. Exactly, filtrating their opinions. Yeah. So it is very hard to reach the young, youngest, young, youngest people. It is, but for example, yeah, to reach them, yes. yeah. But for example, when we have theater tours, you know, and they come as class, so you can really easily um, recognize their feelings <laughs> and what are they interested in and what's boring to them. So you have to adjust to that moment and give them something funny and interesting, or you will fail. So it's you just have to try different. Um, different tools yeah yes it would be very uh, uh, i would like to see the belgrade philharmonic sessions of concerts for babies that we heard about also last year that are lasting for one uh, 30 minutes and are to completely uh, performed in silence babies are totally mesmerized by what they see and what they hear and then they are allowed also to touch afterwards so they're all sold out yeah. for half a year in advance <laughs> and uh, they receive babies from the i don't know cradle who cannot even sit um, up to what five years old or, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, every audience has its own way of receiving and they do when you stimulate them in a good way they do um, they have to respond because respond. it's uh, yeah. it's it's, uh, it's open mind, and uh, it's it's um, the innocence of the child that responds to 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 whatever the signal is. And at this moment, of course, we're talking about the without any music. mental or cultural heritage. <laughs> it's yeah. wonderful. Or yeah, yeah. So it's it's totally clear and. You're an innocent. It reminds me, it reminds me of one example uh, from Lisbon. It's Theatre of Sao Luís. Uh, they presented us um, their practice of having less intensive concerts uh, for children, for people with some kind of difficulties, disabilities, etc. So it's very relaxed performance, you know. Uh, audience is allowed to step out, to have a break, to go in, 
to talk, to have drink or something. So it really makes this relaxed atmosphere. And uh, as they say, it's very successful. It was very needed. Okay. David, do you have recommendations uh, uh, for from this co conference? Uh, we have to send something into the world and see if it is applied. Oh. <laughs> um, right. Um, well, classical music might be uh, more exclusive in the future because most young people today, they will go digital and use digital tools like uh, GarageBand and Logic and Ableton Live and, and Pelodyne and so on. And uh, it's much, much cheaper to buy an, an, a digital tool and make some sounds from it than actually learning a new instrument and also research um, which Eve has been doing shows that uh, if you start playing music very at a young age, you will develop uh, in a way that you don't do if you start later on in life, like most of start as four or five year old, you know. And um, in Stockholm, we have a school called Lilla Akademin, uh, the small academy, and it's actually very much inspired by Russian music education. Centralne Musikalne Skola. Uh, yeah. The they actually play uh, acoustic instruments and they uh, teach children from a young age and they go there uh, from the year of five or six until they are like 17, 18. Then they go maybe to the rock culture music afterwards. And, and uh, if you do that, you will um, educate classical musicians and they will be the next generation of classical musicians. And young people today, they will have to... Uh, be inspired by other youths of similar age uh, and see how they can play actually real live instruments. And uh, if they can try acoustic instruments, they will realize that live music and acoustic instruments have a power that digital instruments have not, you know, and that way we might inspire them. But we also need to embrace the digital evolution and uh, use it in, in a way to benefit, you know, using traditional instruments and digital instruments uh, hand in hand in combination. Mostly we also need to use the digital uh, uh, ways of uh, making classical music available to young people, you know, by channels like YouTube and, and uh, Instagram and so on. Yeah. Uh, that's some of my thoughts uh, at the moment. What you uh, didn't mention here, maybe not everybody knows that Lille Academy, this little academy, is actually a fusion of a, a grammar school with music school. It's a, yeah, that's right, yeah. a style of, uh, how do you call it, uh, um, internat. Uh, they do not sleep in the school, but they have uh, 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 the usual usual teaching, uh, how do you call it? The um, grammar Under. school lessons are uh, in some sort of uh, uh, the merging with music lessons. Yeah, and also at the Royal College of Music, where we work, uh, increasingly more and more students they only play electric guitar or bass guitar, drums, or, or play the electrical keyboard, and fewer and fewer actually play acoustic instruments. Some students actually have never seen or played a, a, a traditional acoustic piano. Mm -hmm. And when they try the piano, they the amazing dynamics, you know, they, they never seen the action before and how you can mix. Exactly. The hand is already adjusted to another instrument. This yeah. is, I teach piano and when parents ask me what to buy, shall they opt for uh, electrical or for acoustic uh, uh, version, then I tell them depends on what you want to play, because do you want to sail or do you want to a ride in a motorboat? Both are exciting in its own way, but make up your mind. That's a very good analogy. Very good. I would like to react on what you said about um, uh, young people uh, being inspired by other people of uh, similar age and what they have achieved. Uh, it, it may uh, it may even be frustrating because uh, to achieve this, the, the, the high level, and this brings us in, in a way back to the question of perfection in classical music. And uh, so do you think that this, particularly today when uh, kids don't really feel like investing a lot of time 
in uh, learning something. Uh, everything is so quick and everything is one click away. And uh, with the acoustic instrument is <laughs> a whole other story. So could this seeing as somebody of the similar age uh, beautifully playing an acoustic instrument after ages and ages and hours of, of practice be both inspiring but also frustrating? Yeah, we know that the concentration span is uh, being much shorter for young people today than it used to be because of the digital availability of all information one click away and so on. So classical music with a form that we talked about, you have to listen for several minutes to appreciate the battlefield of the sonata form or whatever. Um, that's something that they don't really have the concentration to do. So we might try to attract young people by having uh, classical music from minor genres like the lead or, or you know, songs and, and uh, uh, menuets. So, so they can start by playing etudes or whatever uh, to appreciate. Sorry, yes. uh, it is also said that the result of this short uh, concentration span is not only that they grew up on advertising and uh, uh, that's right. Yeah, it is also because of um, video games. Um, yeah immediate evaluation and gratification. Whatever you do, small, small actions on a video game result with some sort of price and some sort of tap on the shoulder. Yeah, While, almost instantly. Yes, yeah. exactly. In, in this process of, uh, let's say, uh, craft making or craft uh, uh, developing. developing crafts, you have to earn that gratification uh, much, much more uh, passionately and in a, in a longer yeah, in a long process of, of, of learning. And that's not popular among young people. You know, at the Royal College of Music in Stockholm, Eva here has actually explored the idea of having, you know, knowledge concerts with a relevant topic. And if you have a knowledge concert with a topic like uh, related to the Me Too movement, uh, we can see that some young students, uh, both girls and boys, are actually very much, uh, they think that uh, gender questions and the Me Too movement are really important and they can be attracted to classical music through that sort of topic, you know, the concept of the uh, knowledge concert. Um, so uh, if you make, you know, classical music relevant to young people in the way that we deal with topics that they can relate to and they think are important. Also like, you know, Greta Thunberg, you know, uh, have you heard about Greta? Yes. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the... Yeah. Environment. Environment, yeah, uh, and uh, being healthy. That's something that young people are really interested in, you know. So if we can tap into that sort of thing, we can make classical music relevant for young people through connecting to relevant topics for them, you know, like the environment and uh, eating healthy and, and so on. I agree very much, yeah. Uh, does anyone have to contribute to this opinion or does anyone remember now any other recommendations that we could um, uh, bring he out here? Well, I have a question uh, to Dave, uh, David. Um, when we, as I was, we were talking about this, uh, this merging of different genres uh, do you see any um within education starting with education do you see collaborations uh, between classical music and theater or maybe opera i think you were starting some new uh, some new education next year or is it this year where you will actually make an opera production no, I, it was an idea. I, I'm not starting it yet, but I had an interesting idea how to, through a play and through uh, fun and mimicking and comedy, introduce a little bit of Swedish history. There are historical operas that we seldom hear, but if we let uh, no. children uh, uh, sort of uh, present it to their peers, that would be nice. No, I was actually, I heard that the, the, the your school is actually creating a new kind of education in Stockholm. That's that true. Would be, that would be with opera and I mean, it's a more collaboration of the, of the arts. Could you please talk about that a bit? Are you to, uh, asking Eva, yes? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, exactly, Ulrika. This is a collaboration uh, when we look also, also this multimodal mm. knowledge. Uh, so we would like to attract uh, opera singers and also our artists and uh, and see how mm. how can we uh, communicate um, skills together in a multimodal context. So this is what we we'll talk about later. So this is, will be a course at. The, the Royal College of Music in, in Stockholm. And uh, it's, oh, it's sort of, it's a uh, course, we will call it uh, an opera master course. Well, opera is a very good medium for that because you have all the aspects, all different mm -hmm. art forms. Right. Yes. There is costume, there is stage, there is uh, uh, directing, uh, producing, mm -hmm. of acting, course, music, yeah. acting, yes. Uh, uh, lots of resource for talented uh, students from different art uh, academies. Yeah, there's one other, uh, one other factor I think we just need to uh, mention, it's about flow. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if we would like to, uh, if we have more knowledge about how important flow is for our health, we have uh, a lot of new audiences, I will say, because if I, I will, try to explain what flow is. Flow is when you have, well, of course, a high degree of focus that feels effortless. And also it's a sense of control when you are in flow, but also an uh, experience of, well, this stretched experience of time as we talked about later, uh, previously, and also an enjoyment of all those factor together create a sense of flow which is uh, an interesting uh, state where we can start to uh, elaborate more with health awareness. So I would think, I, I would say that th this could be an optimal experience factor that we could add into our, uh, well, it doesn't matter where we are, just to be aware of there is such a thing as flow when we do something that is quite hard to do and we, we uh, find it easy. From the point of view of somebody who is playing and had played a lot of concerts, I always was asked by some colleagues of mine, why do you insist so much in techniques? Uh, not just me, but uh, let's say uh, my colleagues from the same school. Or, uh, is Shouldn't music and melodics and uh, feelings, shouldn't they prevail, yeah. musicality? Why do you insist on, on techniques? And then the answer was always because you uh, um, control the tone better if your tools are trained well. But that's not the only answer. This is just exactly what you're talking. This flow gives you an immediate feeling of satisfaction, physical satisfaction, just like when you are jogging, you know. And then you have a feeling that you over uh, done or conquered your body. It is doing exactly what you want and effortlessly, as you say. So as, as long as people have that need to um, perform and uh, expose this uh, uh, I am the owner of my muscles and my body. There will there will be technically demanding uh, performances. That's this is what ballet dancers are doing. Uh, for God's sakes, uh, whatever whatever dance we are talking about, there will always be this. Can I do some more, or can I stretch a little bit more? So um, that's why classical music is sometimes. Uh, overwhelming because there's so much technicity, te technicality in it, right? Well, I, I totally agree. This effortlessness, mm -hmm. the feeling of this actually comes as a result of so much effort that's put in to, 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 to get to that point. And um, uh, the, the question of uh, uh, technical perfection or like high, high, high level of uh, technical performance is uh, is a big deal in a way but it's very simple thing because that's the only tool that gives you an opportunity to express if you are a really musical person if you want to express your musicality you have to be able to to have this very refined technique so you can use your instrument 
and and really express your 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 musicality to the, its finest. Mm -hmm. So I, I I do agree that uh, this um, uh, technical skill um, is uh, very important. It's not the goal for itself, but it's uh, very important uh, for uh, for a performer to 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 be able to present the the arts. Yes, and what you are explaining here is to find a balance between the uh, parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system, and uh, which is very healthy state. And it's also important with uh, the intrinsic motivation here. So it's not that someone else pushes you to motivate yourself. We need to be aware of that the intrinsic motivation is also a key variable into the flow mechanism and if we start to uh, push our students too much we can also uh, fail in that sense that they don't they they procrastinate and they start to not wanting to share their uh, play at all so this is a true balance in between but with flow we can also have this effortless uh, joy within so we can actually measure these things with uh, different uh, methods, heart rate variability, measure heart rate frequency and uh, high frequency, and also breathing. And you know, when we breathe really deep, we activate the diaphragm, and the diaphragm per se activates the vagus nerve, which stimulates the, the good sympathetic, the parasympathetic system. So the parasympathetic system is also part of this wheel of healthy activities in well so this is something that we can do and it's quite easy to do it and we can also uh, look and, and compare different audiences with elderly people 20 percent of uh, the population in Sweden is over 70 years old so there's an immense group there as well we forget about them sometimes but yeah. It seems that the, the performance and uh, artistic practice, uh, uh, physical pr practice, will never disappear. It will never be changed by avatars or uh, digital uh, the assimilation, uh, si simulation, yeah. simulation, yeah. as long as people enjoy doing it. The, because people are not doing art only so that, yeah, I mean, the art doesn't exist only because somebody likes to watch it, but because somebody likes to do it. <laughs> yeah. I like this. Yes. So uh, what I wanted to say and to conclude this with is all our results or our research and everything that we presented so far uh, exists somewhere written, published, or uh, reachable. And... Um, uh, could we hear about that a little bit? Did, uh, do we have, can our listeners who are uh, following this webinar, can, can they find uh, your research or your work or your presentation somewhere on, online uh, in a, a digital bookstore? Or uh, we would like to make it accessible for everyone who followed this and wanted to know more. Yes, I would like to recommend that we do that on web transfers. And there are also a lot of material. No, we don't hear you very well, Emma, sorry. I would suggest that we uh, present a reference list related to the results we have uh, spoken about and also published. Yes. There are, there's a lot of information out uh, on the net. And there is a database called Diva where we publish all our research reports. And of course, there is a rich, uh, there are in Oxford University Press and Springer Books, we have also uh, articles that we could share, but uh, there is a question of how much we can share from a book, but all the publications are for free, so we can share them. Thank you so much. Uh, that goes for David's research as well. Yes, David. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And Katarina, uh, are there any uh, 
sites where we can see all these wonderful photos that you showed to us at the conference and uh, yes yes our website it's a uh, cnt sites or hnk sites mm -hmm. hr so everything is there and we are preparing a museum also it's kind of Yes, kind of theater museum within our theater. So whoever visits Rijeka is very much invited to visit our new museum. It will be opened hopefully during this summer. Yes, Ulrika, we probably have uh, some uh, uh, documentation about these wonderful uh, performances that you were talking about. We will provide all the links and everything in our booklet that we usually we did it last year and we'll do it this year, uh, that we will uh, uh, print or uh, distribute digitally, distribute digitally yeah. for everybody who wants to download it. And uh, you can see all the showcases, all the recommendations and all the conclusions of this conference there. We do not find any uh, questions on the net here that is presented to us we have some nice wishes and very nice um, uh, yeah. co greetings. Congratu greetings and congratulations uh, online if i'm wrong then i suppose the uh, administrator will warn me about but i don't see any questions yeah. yes yeah. on the link so I will wait another 30 seconds to see if something happens about that. And if not, I'm so delighted. I, uh, you joined me and you answered my call for this conference. Uh, please distribute uh, every material that we, uh, which is the result of, of this con conference. And I hope we'll see you again in future and that we will meet in uh, person next time. <laughs> so uh, good work. Thank you extremely. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you, Milicen. Thank you, And thank, thank you, EU Info Center, for this wonderful webinar. So I'm saying goodbye to everyone right now. Um, stay healthy. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.